Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Inez Ponce and I'm the director of the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's seminar. It's part of, it's a special one, it's part of the 25th anniversary celebration of the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. Um, as most of you know, um, we were founded in 1994 by our first director, Dr. E. Richard Brown, fondly known as Rick. And in his honor, we recently hosted a two-day symposium um, honoring his legacy and vision for universal health care. The symposium featured leaders such as Jerry Kaminsky, naturally Mark Peterson, he's in the audience here from Luskin, um, um, and Jerry Kaminsky was one of the scholars who was here when the center was founded 25 years ago back in 1994. Um, Jerry went on to serve as the center's second director. One of the seminar speakers, Dr. Richard Scheffler, along with his colleagues, um, Dr. Shortell, and their other colleagues at the Petrus Center, also um, presented at a symposium and have recently updated their report on sustaining universal coverage through California's integrated care delivery system. Um, and that you can find at the Petrus Center at Berkeley. But today, this seminar um, will continue this robust discussion because we're fortunate that we have in-house here Dr. Jerry Kaminsky. Uh, after Jerry's presentation, we'll have time for questions, um, both from those of you who are with us in person and here at the center. So I was supposed to be advancing some slides. <laughs> this is our 25th anniversary logo. Um, and so for a copy of today's slides, you can email us at healthpolicy at ucla.edu. And then afterwards, stay tuned um, if you missed some of this or you'd like to share this with your colleagues. We do record all of our seminars. We have an archive, and you can find it at www.healthpolicy.ucla.edu slash newsroom. Um, and uh, finally, we also have a newsletter, which if you're not a subscriber, please do subscribe. You'll get the notices about um, the research that we do here and seminars and events. Um, we'll be taking a summer break for those of you who are, are um, subscribers to our channel. We'll be taking a summer break. Um, so join us in the fall when we come back um, for the seminar series. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Jerry Kaminsky. Jerry is a colleague, a professor at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health, a senior fellow with the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research, and he's co-founder of the UCLA UC Berkeley CalSim, California Simulation of Health Insurance Markets, of Insurance Markets. Um, and it is a micro-simulation model used for estimating the impacts of health reform in California. In today's seminar, titled Medicare for All, is it finally time for single payer in the United States? Question mark. Is it finally time? Jerry will explore the latest developments in this high stakes conversation about the possibility of making universal health care available to all Californians. Jerry, uh, more than a lot of my other colleagues, is out there and is spreading the word about uh, on evidence about health care reform. He is a sought after expert at local, state, national, and global levels. And he has expertise in evaluating the costs and cost effectiveness of health care programs. We're very fortunate to have Jerry be a senior fellow here, and I welcome him today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. So it's my pleasure uh, to be uh, to be here today to talk about Medicare for All, and um, it's particularly appropriate and meaningful to me. Although I spend most of my days um, working on issues related to the Affordable Care Act, universal coverage and health care reform has been near and dear to my heart for my entire career since I started graduate school 40 years ago. And the Medicare program is what I uh, first um, studied. I did my dissert dissertation on on Medicare and went to work in, in Washington, D.C. before joining the faculty at UCLA um, 
but I work for a government commission that studies the Medicare program and today is known as MedPAC. So Medicare <clears throat> continues to be uh, an area, a program of interest to me. Um, and um, I, I'm looking forward today to having a discussion about uh, Medicare for all in the United States. So just to remind you, Medicare was enacted in uh, July 30th, uh, on July 30th, uh, 1965, signed into law by then President Johnson. Um, Harry Truman, uh, I, tip, I typically ask my students this, who's sitting to Johnson's left? <laughs> Uh, and of course, uh, none of them know, um, but uh, that's Harry Truman, and Harry Truman had that seat of honor uh, because he supported uh, national health insurance throughout his um, uh, tenure as president, uh, all of those attempts, of course, which were unsuccessful. So the final passage of a, a universal coverage program for seniors in the United States was a significant <coughs> accomplishment. Uh, and just to remind uh, those of you in the audience that uh, 11 months after this date, this signing date, Medicare went into effect. It took 11 months to implicate, uh, to impl implement, not to implicate. <laughs> that was not a slip. To implement. Um, and um, 18 million seniors received Medicare cards uh, by July 1st, 1966, and had access to comprehensive insurance. Half of those seniors had health insurance for the first time as retirees because uh, in 1965, although health insurance uh, was available to some retirees, half of seniors were uninsured. And I've quoted this figure many times over the years. It's a widely cited number, but it's only recently that I've uh, uh, become aware of the source of that information. Uh, Dr. Rice, one of our distinguished colleagues, his mother was a researcher at the Center for uh, National Health Statistics uh, and she actually was responsible for the survey that documented the fact that half of seniors in the early 1960s were uninsured once they retired from work because their employers did not provi provide uh, retiree <coughs> health benefits. Uh, and that survey by Dorothy Rice was actually instrumental in helping the passage of the Medicare legislation. So uh, just to remind you quickly, what was Medicare at enactment? Uh, public law. Uh, 8997 was signed, as I showed you in the photograph, um, in 1965. And it's an amendment to the Social Security Act. And the reason it's an amendment to the Social Security Act is because it was intended to be part of Social Security in 1935. But President Roosevelt backed off of supporting a national health insurance program in 1935, largely because of uh, massive uh, opposition by the American Medical Association. Uh, and if you read the history of the enactment and the failure to enact national health insurance in the United States, uh, the AMA was very effective in 1935 mobilizing the public against the threat of, quote, unquote, socialism and communism that would be reflected by national health insurance. And just keep that in mind because those same arguments will be carted out again in the 2020 presidential election as Medicare for all proposals move forward. But the other point that I want to emphasize is that Medicare was not uh, uh, widely um, and immediately adopted. It was a long legislative process. Uh, bills to enact the Medicare program were first introduced in 1957. So when it was finally enacted in 1965, it was the culmination of eight years of work. And the actual idea for Medicare uh, emerged in 1951. So that was a 14-year sort of window of, of, of um, developing the legislation and, and building support for the program. When Medicare was enacted, it was two parts, part A and part B, and they still exist today. Those are the, the original components of Medicare, and today we call those traditional Medicare. Medicare part A is the true social insurance program. You don't choose to participate. It's financed through payroll taxes. Uh, we all pay into it um, uh, uh, through our, through our uh, payroll taxes. It was modeled on Blue Cross insurance, uh, and it provides coverage for hospital inpatient and facility-based care, but not long-term nursing care. And I'll come back to that later uh, with regard to the Medicare for All proposals. Um, Medicare Part B, in contrast, is not social insurance. It's voluntary insurance. Uh, you elect to join Medicare Part B. 96% of beneficiaries choose it. 
because it's heavily subsidized by the federal government. About 75% of the cost of Part B is subsidized with general tax revenue. The other 25% comes from premiums that, that retirees pay or seniors pay um, uh, for the monthly premium. Uh, and Part B covers largely physician services and outpatient services. Uh, this graph just summarizes quickly uh, the different financing <coughs> sources for the components of Medicare, uh, Part A, Part B, and now Part D, which is the prescription drug benefit that was enacted in 2003 and implemented in 2006. And you can see that for Medicare Part A, it is largely financed through payroll taxes, not exclusively, but 87% of the funding comes from, from those taxes. In contrast, Part B and Part D are roughly 70 to 75 percent financed through general tax revenues, that is the income, corporate taxes, et cetera, that the federal government uh, collects. Uh, and the other roughly 15 to 25 percent of Part B and Part D uh, come from uh, premiums. So the original designers of Medicare intended the program to be the first step to national health insurance. The strategy was, will cover the most vulnerable population and a population that was viewed widely as deserving. After all, seniors are our parents and our grandparents. So the strategy was, we'll extend a social program to a needing and deserving population, and then we'll roll this out to the rest of the population in a relatively short time period. Well, it's 54 years later, <laughs> and we're still waiting for the rollout of the rest of the program. Uh, but we have made some progress uh, in the last 54 years. We had the Social Security Amendments of 1972, which expanded Medicare to disabled individuals and to end-stage renal disease patients who were essentially medically uninsurable and had high medical costs because of the, they needed uh, dialysis. Uh, in 1997, we created the State Children's Health Insurance Program, SCHIP, um, and uh, this is widely viewed as uh, the, the consolation for not passing health care reform earlier in the Clinton administration. Uh, but this was truly a bipartisan effort. Republicans and Democrats said uh, that we need to do something to cover the large percentage of uninsured children and so they created this program. Uh, the Medi I mentioned the Medicare prescription drug benefit, and although this program did not reduce the number of uninsured seniors, what it did is it provided a significant new benefit uh, that wasn't available when Medicare was first enacted. And then finally, the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010, which included two significant components. It, it uh, was built on the expansion of the Medicaid program uh, and federal subsidies to buy private health insurance in regulated marketplaces known as exchanges. This slide shows the progress that we've made in reducing the rate of uninsured, largely because of the, the ACA. But you can see historically, dating back to 1972, that the percentage of uninsured Americans has averaged generally between 16 and 18 percent of the population. We had a little bit of a dip in the uh, mid-1970s, partly due to that expansion of Medicare that I mentioned a minute ago, the, the uh, uh, Social Security Amendments of 1972, and partially due to a change in the way that data were uh, collected and coded. Um, so um, that 12 percent is partly a data artifact. Um, but you can see that for a good portion of the last 40 years, actually the last 50 years now, um, basically one in six Americans uh, reports uh, being uninsured. Um, and that has changed dramatically since 2014 when the major provisions of the Affordable Care Act went into place. Uh, and as I, uh, I'm sure you've noticed, uh, you can see that in this slide that the percentage of uninsured is starting to tick up again for obvious reasons because the Affordable Care Act is, is under attack uh, by the current administration and we're starting to lose some of the grounds uh, that are some of the ground that we've gained, some of the advances. This slide just shows uh, the same information in a slightly different format. This 
And this is now, uh, as I like to tell audiences, my favorite slide. Um, because it captures, if a picture is worth a thousand words, this slide captures a lot about the American healthcare system. Uh, the fact is that you can see at age 65, because of the Medicare program, roughly 98% of seniors have health insurance. And there's still people who haven't paid into the system uh, who uh, are not eligible. But basically, we have close to universal coverage above age 65. We do fairly well with kids, although um, uh, I think that uh, in, a, in a country as wealthy as ours that, uh, that there, no children should be uninsured. Uh, and the graph should look the same way it does above age 65. But you can see we have a health care system that basically puts the working population at risk. And the younger you are, the more at risk you are of being uninsured. Now the slide illustrates that the ACA has been very effective in reducing the rate of uninsurance uh, among the working age population, ages 18 to uh, 64. And there have been some very dramatic reductions. Um, but the fact is that the age group that has the highest rate of uninsurance in the United States are those age 26. And that's because the eight, that's the cutoff for ACA eligibility to stay on your parents' policy. So you fall off a cliff at age 26, and that's the age group that has the highest percentage of uninsured, although significantly lower than it was in 2013. So with that as background, why is Medicare for All on the agenda today? I mean, the, the point is that we were supposed to have this in 1972 or 1973. I was going to college then. We should have all been covered by Medicare for All at that point. Now I'm at the end of my career, and we're still talking about this. So why is it on the agenda now? What, what brought it back? Well, first of all, the ACA is working, but the ACA was never projected to achieve universal coverage. Um, I've been talking about the uh, ACA to audiences. Oh, check it out. So, thank you, Siri. <laughs> I'm going to stop my presentation now and let Siri continue since she's been listening apparently. <laughs> and she knows the answer better than I do. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, okay, so the ACA is working, but it was never projected to achieve universal. The best estimates um, were that we reduced the percentage of uninsured non-senior population to about 9%. Well, I showed you in a previous slide, we're at about 10% 10, 10 right now. So we've, in a sense, we've probably reached the maximum effectiveness of the ACA. So is it good enough for us to have 10% of the non-senior population uninsured? And I'll, I'll just, for argument's sake, say no, that's, that's still not acceptable. And that's why, one reason. The ACA's been under continual attack since 2010, shortly after it was enacted by Republicans. Um, and it's still vulnerable to both congressional and uh, judicial repeal, as well as ongoing congressional and executive <coughs> branch sabotage. So we know that the Trump administration is really depending on the Fifth Circuit uh, uh, judgment that this law is unconstitutional to work its way to the Supreme Court and have the current court agree with the Fifth Circuit decision. And we'll know this. Arguments, I understand the arguments are supposed to start in July. And now when the case will be de decided, but it could be by the end of this year, the Supreme Court will once again be deciding on the constitutionality of this law. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not a betting man, and I'm certainly not a, a judicial analyst, uh, but I would say that there's, my estimate is that there's more than a 50-50 chance that the court will, over, will hold, uphold the Fifth Circuit's decision that the law is unconstitutional. And that will be a political decision that will be wrapped in judicial um, uh, justification. Um, those who've gained coverage under the ACA, which is approximately 21 million uh, Americans, and those non-seniors who 
now have protection against pre-existing condition exclusions. The estimates vary here, but it's as many as 129 million Americans have these protections now, are threatened with losing benefits they didn't have a decade ago. And that's created political support for doing something to protect, um, to ensure protection. Um, the financial vulnerability among those with ESI is substantial, and part due to the rapid growth of high deductible health plans in the last two decades. Kaiser Family Foundation, with support from the LA Times, published uh, uh, both uh, an article and uh, report a week and a half ago on this very topic, documenting how vulnerable uh, individuals are, despite the fact that they have relatively good uh, uh, employment-based insurance. And then finally, Senator Bernie Sanders proved during his 2016 campaign that Medicare for All resonates with a large portion of the population. And I'll be interested, um, uh, I'm looking at Mark now, whether or not anybody predicted in 2015 that a Democrat running on a Medicare for All platform would gain the traction that Sanders did. I didn't see it coming. Uh, Mark's a political scientist. I don't know if he saw it coming or not. But I think it, it caught a lot of people by surprise that there was deeper support for more comprehensive reform than I think a lot of health policy analysts uh, anticipated. So there are a series of reforms that are be, uh, currently before Congress, and I'm just going to characterize them in four general categories. And I'm not going to talk about all, all these categories in detail, but I just want to list them. So there are currently two single-payer proposals uh, in front of Congress. There are various public option proposals. And these are basically similar to what would have been in the House bill version of the Affordable Care Act uh, that never got to, to a full vote. Um, and then there are two uh, buy-in options. So there's the Medicare buy-in option starting at age 50 um, and Medicaid buy-in, which is not limited to age or, or by age. Uh, the, the latter three options, uh, the um, the public option, Medicare buy-in, and the Medicaid buy-in, all, in a sense, build on the existing ACA framework. Uh, some of these proposals include subsidies, either uh, uh, as a substitute or allow individuals to take subsidies in the exchanges and buy the public option or buy, buy into to Medicare, for example. Let me define some terms, though, before uh, I move on to talk about Medicare for All. First of all, single payer is not socialized medicine. It's just not. That's misinformation, a distortion, it's fake news, whatever you want to call it. There are three general types of national health insurance that we should be talking about, to be more precise. And I don't want to be too academic here, but you know, when we start blurring these distinctions, that's that's how people get confused and, and um, how you mobilize opposition. Single payer, strictly speaking, means public financing of a private delivery system. And that's what we're talking about, Medicare for all. Socialized medicine is public financing of, provided through a public delivery system. And the NHS in the UK is the example. Um, all payer systems, which are actually much more common um, are systems that have that are publicly financed with multiple insurers and those insurers are heavily regulated by the federal government or the national government including payments to providers uh, and these are the systems that Germany France Switzerland Netherlands Israel a number of countries use uh, all payer or multi-payer uh, payment systems um, and that's because they have some form of private insurance or funds uh, that are intermediaries between the government and the, and the delivery system. National health insurance also does not necessarily mean no private insurance or no co-pays. Private insurance is available in many of the countries uh, that we're talking about here to cover the cost of benefits that are not covered in the government plan. If you look at the benefit package in most of these countries, it's comprehensive, but it doesn't cover everything. 
And so there is still a private market, uh, and the private market can be large, relatively speaking, but not nearly as large as in the United States. We're talking about maybe 15% of total national health expenditures at the, at the high end, as opposed to roughly 50% in the United States. And many countries with national health insurance systems also employ co-payments. Um, so uh, having a national health insurance system doesn't necessarily mean that there's no out-of-pocket spending at the point of service. Finally, Medicare for All is not the current Medicare program. And I think this is the biggest misconception. And look, I don't know what, you know, if whether Senator Sanders is doing this deliberately or not, but I have to I have to say that when he says Medicare for All, I think he's deliberately overlooking the fact that most people are going to make the connection say, oh, so we're going to have the Medicare program. We're just going to, everybody's going to be enrolled in Medicare. And that's not what his proposal. It's an analogy. And he's using it in that way. But it's, an, it's obscuring some important distinctions. So can we afford single payer? This seems to be the question of the day, or some version of national health insurance, even if it's not the single payer variety. So I'd say maybe the question should be, can we afford not to take some bold action? It's well documented that we spend more than any other nation on health care. And so I'm not going to show you the slides. There's a standard set of slides. I use them myself. Uh, um, the Commonwealth Fund updates the slides annually. We, Everybody in this room, and I think everybody watching, knows that we spend far more than any other nation, and our health outcomes in many dimensions are poorer and quite mediocre in some cases, despite spending much more than any other nation. Uh, but just to quantify how much we spend, CMS estimates that we spent $3.5 trillion on health care in 2017, and that from 2018 to 2027, we're going to spend $47 trillion on health care. And by 2027, uh, we'll be spending over $6 trillion a year in the United States on health care. CMS also estimates that the spending will continue to grow faster uh, than GDP, gross domestic product. Um, and so as a percentage of overall, our overall economy, health care is going to increase from 17.9% to 19.4% within the next 10 years. Actually, this is now eight years away. And of course, the president's budget has a simple solution for this. We're going to just cut these government programs. And we're going to cut them bigly, <laughs> right? We're going to take $1.5 trillion out of the Medicaid program. We're going to reduce Medicare spending by $845 billion over this period. And you can see that these are, first of all, they are significant numbers. Um, but in the context of the $47 trillion that we're going to spend, it's still not really addressing anything other than government expenditures we're still going to be spending a tremendous amount of money. So I would, I want to posit that, first of all, I want to assert, I should say, that Medicare is a very popular program. I'm not showing you the data here. I'm going to ask you to take my word for it. It's well documented. There are numerous studies that show that patient or beneficiary satisfaction with Medicare is higher than employment-based insurance and most private insurance. So that's, I'm asserting that as a fact, if you, and, but I'm not going to present the data. So if Medicare is so popular, why is Medicare for All such a tough sell? I mean, this is a popular program. It benefits one out of six Americans. Why is it so difficult for us to accept the idea that expanding this to the rest of the population might be a good idea? Well. There are significant political and financial slash economic barriers to single payer or any form of national health insurance in the U.S. that are difficult to disentangle, and I'm going to try and disentangle them in a minute. Um, not to mention the fact that we have a cultural and historical heritage that seems to favor private enterprise and markets over government. And that's just a fact. It's who we are. It's in our DNA. 
So that's a barrier that's got to be overcome because our instinct as a nation is to always let the private market do it. It's always going to be better. And that's debatable in healthcare, but that is built into who we are as a people. What these economic and financial and political interests do is to create vested interests in the status quo that translate into intense political opposition. The fact is that the status quo works for a lot of stakeholders. As public health professionals, we may not be satisfied with 10% of the population being uninsured, but there are plenty of groups doing quite well in the current healthcare system and don't really want to rock the boat because they're doing just fine. And if you have any doubt about that, look at some of the top performing stocks on Wall Street. So at the risk of oversimplifying what is really a very complex political landscape, I'm going to identify three barriers that I think need to be overcome before Medicare for all can become a reality in the US. And I'm going to illustrate them with three slides. So the first is another one of my favorite slides. I've been telling students the information that's contained in this slide for decades. But it only was about two years ago that I discovered that the Pew Foundation has actually been tracking this information for over 50 years. And that is a measure of trust in government. Now, almost everybody in this room, let me see if I can make this work. I'm going to put the, the pointer on the, the part, the, the, uh, the year where public trust in government went below 50% for the first time and it's essentially stayed there. So it's basically 1973, 1974. And I think everybody in the room, whether you were alive during this period or not, knows what went on that year. And if you don't, go watch The Post or All the President's Men. <laughs> Very good films. Public trust. I grew up in an era, Mark, several of us in the room, grew up in an era where we trusted government. Government was a positive force in our lives. And that trust has been not only damaged, but it looks like we've almost permanently destroyed it. <coughs> the majority of Americans report that they don't trust government. Now, why is this significant with regard to Medicare for all? Well, it's the significance is in the red box. If we're going to pass a Medicare for all law, Senator Sanders' proposal, we'd have to transfer roughly about $1.7 trillion of private spending. That includes private health insurance, most of which is employment-based, and out-of-pocket spending for co-payments and deductibles, et cetera, and things that aren't covered by insurance. We have to incorporate all of that into the Medicare for All plan. We have to transfer that onto the federal budget. Well, it means we've got to increase the federal budget by roughly 35 percent. Now, this is a bill. This is a no-brainer for Republicans. Big government, tax and spend Democrats. So this is a regardless of the issue of public trust. This is just an easy one for Republicans to, to try to shoot down. Big government, big government's not the solution, and this program is going to significantly increase government. The second major barrier, in my opinion, is the loss of privilege associated with private employment-based insurance. So the Kaiser Family Foundation does monthly polling on a wide variety of healthcare issues. And in January, they asked the voting public, likely voters, I think is, is uh, who's in their same, or at least people of voting age, not necessarily likely voters what their support is for different forms of national health insurance. So the top, let me see if I can again use this. The first question is, 
with regard to the Medicare buy-in. And you can see that there's broad bipartisan support for this. Republicans and independents support this almost as highly as Democrats. So the Medicare buy-in is, is a popular option. Allowing people who don't get health insurance at work to get insurance through the Medicaid program, so the Medicaid buy-in, equally strong bipartisan support. Now we go to creating a national government administered health plan. This is the, this is the public option. Independents and Democrats still strongly supportive. Now Republican support is starting to, starts to erode. Why? Because it's a new government program. It's okay to let people into existing programs, but creating another government program that erodes Republican support. And then finally, when we get to the, to the bottom of the slide, having a national health plan often known as or called Medicare for All, uh, where all uh, insurance would be provided by a single plan through the government. Democrats and, and independents still strongly supportive. Republican support falls off the cliff. It's now down to about 23%. And I also wanted to point out, actually at the bottom of the slide, uh, uh, information that uh, uh, just came out the other day in a, a letter from Victor Fuchs to the, the uh, to JAMA, um, and in Fuchs's article, he's talking about whether or not having an employment-based system makes the U.S. healthcare system less efficient and more unfair, as the title says. Um, and he points out that for people above 400 percent of poverty, just to provide the context, that's $100,000 a year, roughly, for a family of four. For anybody earning more than that, 85% of those families have employment-based insurance. But between 100 and 250% of the federal poverty level, only 35% have employment-based insurance. So when I talk about the threat of losing privilege, taking away employment-based insurance in a Medicare for All system is a real threat to people who are basically moderate to high income earners. And what we're talking about is redistributing wealth. And that is a threat to people who believe that they're losing something. The third factor, and by the way, all of these factors are I mentioned are really interrelated, is the potential loss of, pri of profits related to private insurance. Now this is related, the profits that I'm talking about are the profits for healthcare providers. Uh, this example is uh, for hospitals, uh, and this shows the ratio of payments to cost for private insurance, Medicare, and Medicaid. And you can see, again, let me use this pointer here, the Medicare and the Medicaid programs uh, as of 2015, and the data uh, really doesn't change that much from year to year, Medicare and Medicaid are paying hospitals about 85 to 88 percent of the cost of care for those patients, which is another way of saying every Medicare and Medicaid patient that walks in the door, you're losing money. So why isn't the hospital industry screaming? Well, because they can subsidize those losses with the profits they make on privately insured patients. And again, remember, the vast majority of private insurance is employment-based insurance. So the payment rate, uh, payment to cost ratio for private insurance is about 144%. And I would suggest, and, and I've actually said this for years, this is a, this is a hidden tax. If the federal government doesn't want to raise taxes to fully support Medicare and Medicaid, what they're doing, what Congress is doing by not acting is letting the market tax private insurance to cover the lower payment from Medicare and from Medicaid. But what this does is it creates 
an incentive for hospitals, and, and this is true for physicians and other providers as well. It creates a hierarchy. And you don't need to be an economist to understand that there's a hierarchy here. If you're in business, if you're in the hospital business, you want privately insured patients because that's where you're making money. You'll accept Medicare and you'll accept Medicaid if you have to, but you really want to maximize your, your private insurance. Now, uh, the other uh, information that I have on here is that when you blend these three payment amounts or these, these ratios, on average, hospitals are being paid about 111% of current Medicare rates. And hospitals, on average, are profitable, but there's still a significant percentage of hospitals that run losses on an annual basis. So let me draw some conclusions from the points that I've been making. Public trust in government is not going to, to improve overnight. Um, but Medicare for all could be a way of improving our faith in government by eliminating once and for all the very real fear that millions of Americans face every day that they can lose their health care coverage at any time. There's a vulnerability out there that extends to lots of people, not just the currently uninsured. Fears about losing ESI can be addressed by focusing on the fact that individual and employer costs could be lower under Medicare for All. Now I'm specifically talking about uh, Senator Sanders' proposal. Um, because in his proposal, he is advocating financing that relies more on wealth taxes. Um, his proposal would be financed with, uh, rather than uh, employment-based insurance premiums, there would be a flat tax on payroll. There would be a, a, a family contribution that would be paid through the income tax system. But there would be financing through broader taxes on wealth and high-income individuals. Um, that would not only lower and make employer costs more predictable, it also might actually spur wage growth. And I will tell you from uh, you know, confidential conversations that we've had in, uh, over the years with uh, uh, labor advocates across the state that as much as they fight to preserve the health insurance benefits of their members, they also acknowledge that it is a drag on wage growth. And this is initially, this is an argument that goes back 100 years. There were labor leaders in the early 1900s who said national health insurance might, if we advocate for national health insurance, it might prevent people from joining labor unions because everybody will have this benefit. So they won't want to join the labor union because we're providing the health insurance. So it's a conundrum, but the point is that there's lots of data to suggest that wage growth is being suppressed because all of the increase in labor productivity goes to pay for health, increasing health benefits. The problem is, though, that if we eliminate ESI, it's going to open the, new, uh, open the door for a new round of Harry and Louise swift voting attacks. Now, I'm, I'm mixing my metaphors there. <laughs> so Harry and Louise, again, you know, most of you are too young. Harry, look it up on YouTube, OK? The, the current head of the Federation of American Hospitals was the creator of the Harry and Louise commercials in the early 90s. These were the commercials that were highly affected and effective, and Mark again can, can testify, highly effective in raising doubts about the Clinton reform. And so I highly recommend that you look, look up the Harry and Louise commercials on YouTube. You can still find, and of course, the swift boating is a reference to the, the carry attacks. But the point is that any attempt to do away with employment-based insurance is going to uh, allow Republicans to attack um, whatever Democrat is proposing this and whatever Democrat get, starts to get further down the line if they're supporting Medicare for all. It's going to find a way to raise doubts 
about whether or not this is really a good thing for America. Uh, and then, of course, there'll be other more explicit uh, accusations of socialism and communism isn't as as, uh, uh, as effective as it used to be uh, in <laughs> as an argument against adopting something. The final point that I want to make is that provider payments can't be set at current Medicare levels. And this is one of the issues with regard to the Sanders. Are they going to be med current Medicare rates? Because if you go back and look at the slide I just showed you, that means that hospitals are going to take a 12% hit on every patient that walks in the door. And that's just not sustainable, OK? So one th message that advocates of, of Medicare for All have to be clear on is that we've got to decide how to set rates in a way that makes the industry sustainable, but also eliminates the current um, uh, incentive to treat privately insured patients over publicly insured patients. Because otherwise, you're just going to allow the industry to continue to specialize. And, I'm, and again, this isn't just the hospital industry. Provider groups, uh, lots of facilities target high profit patients based on their insurance status. So anyway, final thoughts before opening it up for Q&A. I think that the question for the upcoming presidential campaign in 2020 is should Democrats go all in on Medicare for all? And there's a lot of debate going on right now. Um, or should the candidates support more moderate public option or buy-in plans? I mean, the, for example, the data that I showed you suggests that those have broad bipartisan appeals. So, you know, why not appeal to the middle? Um, well, there are a couple arguments I'm going to make for not appealing to the middle. And I might be wrong, but I'm going to make them anyway. Republican politicians have been getting reelected for three cycles now, running against Obamacare. And they're going to do it again. And if, unless the court solves that for them. So why should Democrats believe that Republicans are suddenly going to support moderate options like the Medicare buying? What are they going to do? Say, look at the Kaiser Family Foundation polling. Your, your voters have, you know, are in favor of a Medicare buy-in. The response is, yeah, but they reelected me. And I said I was opposed to that. So they might tell Kaiser that, but I'm, I'm in office and we're going to get rid of your health care. So, I'm not convinced that Republicans are going to be responsive to the kind of results that I showed you in the polling. Um, so maybe in an era where bipartisan support isn't possible, uh, maybe there really isn't any value to appealing to the middle. And I think that's why you're seeing the emergence of, of the progressive uh, wing of the Democratic Party right now. On the other hand, what is it going to take to defeat President Trump in 2020? Medicare for all mobilizes Democratic voters, then it's the best strategy, um, even if the Senate doesn't flip. In other, word, in other words, if we get a Democratic president, but not a Democratic Senate, you're not going to get Medicare for all. But you'll have a Democratic president. But if Medicare for all is effective in mobilizing Democratic voters, and they gain a simple majority in the Senate, then I think there's a pathway to Medicare for all. Uh, because I think that Democrats are ready to exercise the nuclear option, which is, and again, what is the nuclear option? It's getting rid of the filibuster rule. Because the Republicans have basically completely gutted the filibuster rule right now anyway. So it, it would be easy for Democrats, if they have a, a simple majority in the Senate in 2021, to say, we're just going to get rid of it entirely. You've already gutted the filibuster rule. We're going to get rid of it, and we're voting for Medicare for all. We're, we're going to promote our agenda. Uh, we're not going to try to compromise. We're, we're done with it. Um, so Thank you, Dr. those are my Kaminsky. thoughts on the matter. Thank we you very much for your attention. We actually generated some questions during I your talk. I would like to open uh, it up the for first Q &A. one is Thank you. Uh, a comment and a, a question on what is your sense of what will happen with respect to Medicare for all should the Supreme Court rule to repeal the ACA? I 
I think based on what I've said uh, in my talk today, I think that it's going to increase. I think that if we take that large a step backwards, um, and even though it'll, you know, won't be a politicians voting it out, so the Republicans can maybe try to distance themselves from this, they're not going to be able to. So it's 21 million Americans are going to be uninsured, and over 100 million are going to be vulnerable to having pre-existing condition uh, exclusions reintroduced into the marketplace and be potentially vulnerable to paying more in the future. So I think it's going to mobilize, and, and uh, not just Democrats, that people will say, we need to have a health care system where we can't, just because there's shifting political winds, today we have health care benefits, tomorrow we don't. Uh, we need to have something that's guaranteed. We, we do need a Medicare for all, because even though Medicare was hotly contested, um, Thank you. it's 54 years later. Question from and the nobody's audience. talking about repealing Medicare. By the way, as you there kept talking, talking about your analysis, your, your fan base grew out uh, 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 online. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, thank you. My question is, um, with this or any other program, I mean, one of the basic problems with health care is it's just too expensive. It, our surgeries are more expensive, hospitals are more expensive, drugs are more expensive than any other country. And, and until we fix that, this just seems like paving over a, a really bad problem. Any thoughts on how you get to that real problem? Yeah, so I, I think you'll notice that I avoided the issue yeah, of why are why are we why are we you know fifty percent more expensive than any other country? Um, because I don't think that we can get to twelve percent of GDP or ten percent or eight percent. So I think that we are we are where we are, and if we're going to reform healthcare in the United States with a national health insurance system, that I think that the only feasible pathway is to say we're going to slow growth into the future. We're going to create the right incentives into the future. We're going to explicitly regulate prices in the future so that we slow down the cost increases. Now that in and of itself is not going to guarantee slower growth, but it will help. Medicare program has been regulating prices for hospitals since 1983, for doctors since 1992. And the growth in Medicare expenditures on a per capita basis is equal to or lower than private insurance. So price controls work in all the countries that I alluded to earlier, as well as here in the United States. Um, but there's the danger of, of what's the impact on, on um, innovation um, and how do we achieve greater efficiency. But I will tell you that we're not going to achieve efficiency here as long as there's an open-ended budget for health care. That the way you achieve efficiency is to impose some budgetary constraints. State of Maryland's doing it now with the hospital um, global budgeting payment system. Uh, they've been regulating hospital rates there for almost 40 years, but now they've moved to the next stage, which is global budgeting of hospitals. You've got to provide some constraint. Otherwise, the growth just continues, uh, and healthcare takes up a bigger and bigger portion. But I don't think we can get to 12 percent or even 14 percent because what that means is taking money out of this system. It truly means cutting, and healthcare is a labor-intensive, so it means jobs. It means millions of jobs or salary cuts. And you know who in the room who's a healthcare professional is willingly going to take a forty percent? Thank you, and I think that um, you answered of, some of the you know, online questions about price the controls. It, it's just, On the consumer you can't side, there's a question of so. how do proponents of single payer convince current Medicare Advantage plan patients mm -hmm. that reform would be better for them? Well, that is a tough one because 
Medicare, uh, I didn't talk about Medicare Advantage, but Medicare Advantage um, does not exist under the Medicare for All proposal. Uh, it's a little unclear to me whether Kaiser, how Kaiser functions under Medicare for All. Um, I suspect that if Medicare for All moves forward um, with one of the presidential candidates, that someone in those campaigns is going to have to answer those questions. And whether Medicare for All means no managed care whatsoever or no, say, capitated uh, payments. Uh, but I, I will tell you that, that I think that if you don't have an answer to the question, does or, or I'm sorry, if you don't have a positive answer to the question, does Kaiser permanent Questions pay survive? Yes. The answer is not yes. Uh, you're going to lose millions of California What about the, the states? Let's say that none of those scenarios play out at the federal level. Uh, ACA got a start because Massachusetts uh, implemented a model that uh, the feds followed. So California has been talking about this. So what about at the state level to demonstrate a model? So So I think the reason why the, the, the attention shifted to the national level uh, is because uh, we, we tried in California. We had a bill two years ago, and um, that bill d didn't go anywhere. And we can debate why that bill didn't go anywhere, but I think that the best explanation is that a single-payer system at the state level is extremely difficult to enact without an act of Congress. I can show you a diagram that says it, and I know financially, not politically or legally, financially the idea of having all the revenue flows that currently some go to Medicare, some go to Medicaid and then come back. If we could capture all those flows into a state financing authority, we could in a state like California or a state like Vermont or a state like Maryland have a single payer system. The problem is that there are legal barriers to recapturing or repurposing Medicare funds in particular. Even in Maryland where there is an all payer rate setting and global budgeting, the federal government doesn't turn over, doesn't allow the state of Maryland to control its Medicare um, uh, contributions to the federal government. It allows Maryland to regulate what Medicare pays in to the system, and it has a waiver that promises that the current system will save a certain amount of money for the federal government. But the federal government doesn't just write a check to Maryland and say, here, you decide what to do with your Medicare dollars. I think that that's the barrier. Uh, I know that uh, the uh, advocates for single payer in California and um, uh, 562 uh, argued vehemently that these, all of these uh, barriers could be overcome in California. All the waivers could be achieved uh, or obtained. Um, and I happen to disagree. And I think that uh, uh, the report that was produced um, by Manet um, for the state um, about a year and a half ago Convinced Governor Thank you. Newsom we are that at maybe the barriers were more significant. There are actually some other questions, but I am going to adjourn today yeah. and invite all of you to uh, our website uh, and follow follow Dr. Kaminsky as he answers all these questions for for many an audience. But we thank you today for this excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a lot of thank yous.